Welcome to Life on Life's Terms, episode 61. It's your host, Justin, with... And it's Kenny. And we're going to get into <laughs> allowable prejudices. What we... Uh, are we going to a place of no selection and Christmas when we were youngsters? However, before we get into those wonderful topics, we're going to do our shout outs so we can have our bills paid by a person named Liam Connolly at Connolly Law. For all of your Canadian law, will estate, and media issues, please Google Liam Connolly at Connolly Law. For all of your counseling needs, for all of your counseling needs, such as addictions and family counseling, please Google adaras.ca. That's A-D-A-R-S dot C-A. The famous Chris Suchet will be able to accommodate you through Skype or FaceTime for all your mental health needs, regardless of where you are geographically. Then, of course, there's always Modern Gravity. The easiest shopping you will ever do all year. Our Holiday 2-Pack is back. So for $99, you and your loved one or whoever can go and experience a float at Modern Gravity here in the Edmonton area. This would mean for $99, all you have to do is go to their website, click the little thing that says $99 or the Holiday 2-Pack special. It will be over by the end of, well, December 31st, they will not be giving this $99 two-pack value. Typically, each float is $65, so they've dropped the price significantly. And that's thanks to our sponsors. Thank you all. Thanks, Modern Gravity. <clears throat> How's your morning going so far? Well, my voice is pretty raspy. I sound like <clears throat> Gary V. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hopefully, I could just start making money like him. <laughs> um did you notice maybe some of our listeners might know who art bell is you probably know who art bell is because you've done enough time so he's from coast to coast before uh george nori and his voice was not very low and then all of a sudden when he went out on his own after uh, he left coast to coast his voice like if you ever listen on youtube it just goes like like his balls finally dropped Almost. Well, he, he had his alter ego because he's out on his own now. Yeah, I guess, eh? Yeah. That, that could be it. A chance to recreate. Yeah. Um, so allowable pre prejudices. You and I had a conversation just before the mics went on about what exactly that is. So I heard this from Jordan Peterson, who was talking with um, uh, Joe Rogan on the G GRE podcast. Basically, what what is allowable prejudice? Well... So when we're picking a partner, I know, right? We're, we're going into into maybe a place where we might need Liam's services. <laughs> <laughs> People are just too word sensitive these days. Well, yeah. So let's 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 unpack this a little bit. So allowable prejudices. What is an allowable prejudice? I mean, when we're picking our partners. Such as uh, whole, you know, whoever your partner is, there are specific things that we like about them in order for them to be a partner, and it's not about you know this person's too fat or this person's too skinny or this person is this or this person is that. I think it's more one of these things where you know we're looking at procreation, right? If they chew with their mouth open, they're gone. In in the hetero world. You know what I mean? In the hetero world, it's about procreating. Um, I can't really speak about the homosexual world because that's not that's not the world I'm in. You know, I am a hetero guy, so like I don't under like I I can't speculate um, what the picking process is, so to say, or the filter process is for the homosexual world. So I'm not I'm not gonna speculate. I can only speak about being a hetero man. And I can tell you that most of my selection, or when I select a partner, it's about procreating for the most part. There is characteristics that I definitely look for that are amicable towards, or amicable towards my own um, personalities, you know, or okay. personality. Yeah. Um, like I wouldn't date. I probably wouldn't date some hard wing fucking lefty like that. That wouldn't be for me. Very controversial. Well, it's just, it's just, just not for me. I mean, I don't, I don't agree with a lot of the, you wouldn't be able to talk around her. Well, I think, I think one of the things is too, is that, um, 
when it comes to personality differences between myself and a hard lefty, I'm not, I'm not a hard leftist and I'm not a hard right person. I'm more in the middle of the spectrum. And for somebody at this moment, and I'll use Justin Trudeau as, as an example, for somebody at this point to look at Justin Trudeau and say all of his policies are great because he's a liberal, well, the fact, fact of the matter is the issues that he's bringing to Canada are nothing about conservative or liberal, just like I wrote in last week's blog. It's more about the infringement of our Charter of Rights in Canada. That's that's like this is this is bipartisan. This is not a partisan issue. This is a bipartisan. And, and what I'm finding with a lot of liberals is that they're unwilling to abandon ideology over philosophy. So their philosophy becomes their identity and their identity becomes their ideology. And even when they're proven wrong, they still say, fuck you, you're wrong because this is my identity. Well, when we start getting that tribalism in politics, that's an issue. That's a huge issue. That's that's grounds for a civil war. You know, that's that's how civil war breaks out, right? Is nobody's willing to relent in any of their philosophical ideology in regards to their in regards to their identity. Philosophy doesn't necessarily shouldn't necessarily dictate our identity in my opinion. So again, back to this allowable prejudices. For instance, some of the prejudices that I have is I kind of look for a mate or a partner who is probably able, able to have childbirth, right? I mean, yeah, you want to procreate. And if that's not there, you'll feel it. Well, and what are you doing? Like for me, my my philosophy is, well, I'm here to procreate with, with the opposite sex. You know what I mean? And uh, so there's physical physical attributes that I look for in order for that. And I'm attracted to that just naturally. So again, this, this allowable prejudice is we could bring this, this, um, this whole entire thing back to nature or nurture. So nurture being your, like your mother taught you a bunch of stuff when you were young, nature means you already knew it. So for instance, when you're a baby and you're born, you already know how to suckle for milk. Nobody can teach you that, you know. Same thing with you know how to breathe. That's a nature thing. Nobody can teach you how to breathe, right? Um, nurture, you were taught how to walk. That, that, was, that wasn't something that you just came out of the womb knowing. So when we're looking at prejudices, what prejudices are nature? Because these are something that your animal self kind of look at and, and is very, very attracted to. And like you had said the word, I think you had said, like, this is an unconscious bias. Yeah, well, so, uh, sometimes it can be unconscious because you're not even aware that you're going after that type of individual when you're looking for a partner. Well, and I think this is the other, like you and I have picked some probably pretty fucked up partners <laughs> in our lives, right? And I think, like, especially oh. in active addiction, you know, I hope we're not doing so now. Uh, we could be depending on where we are in our in, in our growth, right? Well, now I find it like a lot like my mother, the girls that I'm attracting. Yeah. That's fucked up too. <laughs> that is fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's always there's always that little boy that's looking for their mom to a degree. Yeah, mom issues. I think we all as men we all have that because that's what raised us. So we're hoping for that parental guidance to be with our children. You know what I mean? Like or me forever. I hope not because then <laughs> then again I'm going to suggest to you to read a book called Codependent No More by Melody Peaty. There might be there might be some release that needs to happen in good old Kenny's life. So I, I, I went to read it and I just have the workbook. I don't have the actual book. Oh. I have like the second add-on. Well, maybe Santa will go and get you that book. Yeah, for, Santa for Justin. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's necessary reading, I think. You're getting that Jordan Peterson one. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, the modern gravity thing too came to life on life's terms as as kind of a a Christmas gift to us, which was really really nice from Matt. It was the best ever. That was amazing. Um, so so yeah the the uh, allowable prejudices what would you consider allowable prejudices so what's well, like what's your raising list? kids raising kids that was one of the first things i saw, thought about because like 
you don't want your kids to have certain experiences and you don't want them to ha go through struggles like you went through. So you're going to like parent them in a pre in in a pre uh, prejudice way. Like mm -hmm. you're going to deter them from certain types of kids and you're going to yeah. you're going to encourage them to float towards, you know, like healthy activities and sports and different extracurricular stuff to challenge them you know what i mean mm -hmm. so right now al already like i can tell with my daughters i'm pushing them in certain areas without them being aware of it so is this a conscious thing that like in the moment because so now you're looking at it in a well, conscious it, filter right well i suppose it's both because it's nature because you want to protect your young but it but it's like nurture because mm -hmm. It was like a learnt thing, you know, because you're you're learning from your mistakes or or the things your parents did that you don't want to repeat. Sure. Right. Now, are your prejudices based upon stereotypes? Because stereotypes are learnt, right? And I mean, I could be I could be just as much of a fucking French frog as the next Frenchman, right? I just know at the end of the day that it's up to me not to act like a Frenchman. If I want to be those stereotypes, I can be, but it's for me, it's a conscious decision not to be a, a French frog. It's it's the same thing with what's a French frog. Well, some guy who like uh, they they uh, accentuate their accent, right? Not no. all French people have an accent. You don't have to have an accent. No, yeah, I don't. <laughs> I can speak French, and I don't. Right. Um, the other thing is, is like uh, the ignorance of some French people, like uh, you'll just hear them start talking about like Bali. What the fuck is Bali? Like they've never heard this word before in their life. Like Bali. Bollywood. Yeah. Like yeah. that, that kind of stuff. So there, there's they're acting like a French person and there's a bit of ignorance and arrogance that can come from that plays into the stereotype of a French frog, so to say. Trudeau plays into that stereotype. He's very, very arrogant, and his arrogance plays off as being the French bourgeois. Like, we don't... Most people in Quebec, and this... I mean, he grew up in Westmount. He didn't grow up in no fucking La Salle, and he didn't grow up in Jacques Cartier, and he didn't grow up in Park X. Like, he didn't... And he didn't... He sure as hell did not grow up in a place called trois Rivières. He did not grow up in those places. He grew up on the rich side right next door to Brian Mulroney's family. You know what I mean? Like he doesn't, he has no idea of what it is to, he knows what it is to go slumming, but he has no idea what it is to live in the slums, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so like you can live out those stereotypes and he does it maybe even unconsciously, but he is those stereotypes. Whereas most French people my age don't want to be all about separatism. We don't all want to be uh, living out those supposed French stereotypes. You know, some people have an accent and they can't get rid of it and that's fine. But are you an arrogant asshole? Are you, an, are you ignorant? Are you trying to learn? Do you read English things? Do you, do you speak English? Do you speak both languages just as fluently as you do your native language. That's that's kind of the piece about not playing out your stereotypes, right? And it's a conscious decision, right? I don't want I don't want French people to be perceived as some some fucking dick. You know what I mean? Like I don't want that I don't want to be a participant in perpetuating that stereotype. So yeah. it's my responsibility not to. You can be a white honky all you fucking want. Well, it's kind of just like you and I how we're how we're uh, not living out the stereotypes of being a gangster or a criminal past or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So, and and that's and I think that's the same thing with allowable prejudices, right? If somebody was going to have a bias or a prejudice against us because we were ex-convicts, because we were living that way out, suitable. You're entitled to your own opinions, and you're you're entitled you're entitled to your prejudices. But the problem is, or the reason why a lot of people have a difficulty with this conversation, and why it becomes so difficult, is because people want to uh, have this idea that there are no allowable prejudices. We shouldn't have a prejudicial view. Well, guess what? Prejudice is is what keeps you safe from the convict I used to be. 
Okay, if you saw me with a group of individuals that were straight up gangsters, that's why we never, ever came together in public ever, because when we were out there conning and doing what we were doing, the reason why we never came together in a group publicly, the people I was with was because those business people that I was fucking conning would know exactly what group I was with. And so did the police. Yeah. So my point is that prejudice kept you safe from the wolf that I used to be, right? Like, why would you ever want to do business with a gangster? You don't. No, you don't. Because I'm going to take every dime that you have when I was in that lifestyle, right? That prejudice kept you safe from me, right? So, so again, what's an allowable prejudice, you know? And, and I think... Again, we talk about acceptance quite often on the show. We need to accept exactly who the fuck we are. We need to accept we're your animalistic side. You need to take responsibility for that and say to yourself, what is acceptable? What has kept me safe? It's, it's, it's full on true. You know, like I don't think, I mean, do you really want to be with a hooker? I used to. And now? No. And why is that? Because it, it's fucked up. <laughs> well, I mean, there's also the high risk of an STD or an STI. Mental health. Right? You're, yeah. yeah. Like, like there's a whole bunch of issues there. Murder, murder, suicide. I heard this in a meeting a long time ago, and, and I think recovering addicts who listen to this uh, are really going to identify with this. Why in the fuck do you want to rebuild? You deserve something brand new. You have credit. Go to the fucking, go to the brand new car dealership and get yourself a brand new partner that doesn't have a rebuilt fucking motor in it like you do, you know, because two addicts are just going to get sicker and sicker together. It's very unlikely that I've ever seen an addict couple make it together in any fellowship or even in other fellowships. It just doesn't work. Okay. Okay it's like you and I, when we sit down and we start talking about program or we start talking about the things that we went through in sobriety, we know the game that we're playing with each other. Yeah. You've read the book. I've read the book. I've done a set of steps. I continue doing those kinds of things, so on and so forth. We know the game. Well, when you're sitting there with your partner and you say to your partner, you say something like, uh, uh, well, uh, you know, these are my shortcomings, blah, 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 blah. Please call me out on them. They're fucking, your partner knows right away in recovery. They're like, you're fucking talking about me, you fucking prick, right? How dare you take my inventory? I may or may not have said that in the last couple of days. But, but that, and when it, we're working with somebody, like when, I shouldn't say working, but when we're in a relationship with somebody who's in recovery, they see that shit and they're like, fuck you. And they internalize it. Right. And it's not about being internal. It's not about taking somebody's inventory or being prejudicial towards them. It's about I have shortcomings and I want to be on top of them and change them. Call me out on it. Call me out on it so that I don't do this anymore because I don't like myself at the end of the day when I do these shortcomings. When I when these personal character defects come out, I don't like myself at the end of the day. Call me out on it so I can change it right? That's the whole point of it. But when you have two fucking people in recovery, having that conversation, all that comes out of it is the internalization of this motherfucker just took my inventory. Yeah. That's not normal. He says he's talking about him, but he's really talking about me. Exactly. And I don't give a shit how much time people have. Time is not a qualifier of how great your recovery is. I've seen people with 10 years, 12 years of recovery, and, and it's just shit. Like, it's just shit. They're fucking dry addicts. They're not having a good time in life. They're being fucking pricks. Their stereotypes are through the roof. Can't work because they're still doing a meeting a day three years later. Or or their prejudices are to a point where it's unhealthy. And they're, they just have this filter of, like, everybody's fucked. And the only people that are good are recovered people. Well, I'm, I'm here to tell you, man, I went to meetings so that I only have to go back to meetings every once in a while, well, not yeah, every you, fucking day and only hang out with addicts for the rest of my fucking life. That's not what I want. No. Right. I didn't get recovered for that. Yeah. You know, so, so we talked a little bit about what allowable prejudices are. What do you think are not allowable prejudices? What should you not qualify in picking a mate? Um... 
someone who has devils that dance well with my devils. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Again, that's that safety thing, right? Yeah. So I think that's kind of healthy, right? That's a healthy prejudice. What I would say would be an unhealthy prejudice is something like, you know, that person right there just as, uh, that there's, there's just something about them with no actual fact that I don't like. Like, I don't know, the fucking, they're, 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 the nail polish on their fingers just doesn't, just doesn't fucking float my boat. Well, that to me is not enough to say, uh, I can't talk to this person. You know what I mean? That's, that's not enough. But if it was something like, you know, this girl's still a prostitute, she's doing what she's doing and I want to have a meaningful relationship, <laughs> that's probably not the person I'm going to have a meaningful relationship with. Well, so so that's where I'm gauging an appropriate prejudice and a non-appropriate prejudice. Yeah. We're probably going to feel the repercussions and get some prejudice uh, effects from our show with the cop. Oh, for sure we are. <laughs> for sure we are. Like in our social, in our social milieus, probably. Yeah. But so is he. Yeah. Like he talked about it. He even said, like Mike Elliott was even saying something like... And I'm sure he's not going to mind me disclosing this, but he said, even in the show, he said, we as the police or Edmonton police have to change our perspective of ex-convicts and reform and what that looks like. Yeah. Like, like he said that. So, and then he even said off the mic that there was already people taking a step back from him because he came and talked to us. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And for you and I, like really at this moment, who, who, the way, the way how I see it is those are not my colleagues ever from that life today. No. They mean nothing to me today. And if they walk away, that's just me shaking off the rust. Yeah. That, I, that's, that's all it is. I put it in my blog for that episode just last night when I was cramming it out. But, uh, you mean last week? Cause this would be last week. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that. I was I was a little bit shook that first meeting that we had when he walked into the coffee shop and he had the great big cop emblem and I'm like oh man that's so he bag yeah this is so he bag well because you almost I think like the first couple experiences I had with police and I even wrote this in the blog too was like the nervousness that I would get right I didn't I and I'm like I'm gonna go out on a limb here but maybe maybe I've met police officers in my previous life where they were just as apprehensive of meeting me as I was meeting them because there might have been a bag of money going across the table, right? So they didn't come like that. But everybody can see a cop. You know what I mean? They, they may not have came with a badge hanging off of their chest, but everybody knows a cop. So I never had fear of talking with the cops or having to do business with cops, so to say business, and I say that with air quotes, because the people that I was around back then, I mean, we, those people were pretty, like, they were pretty solid. So it didn't matter. And I solid as in saying, like, we wouldn't rat. You know what I mean? That kind of stuff. That, that didn't happen, really. Um, so when you were so seen with something like that, you just better make sure that you had the money to qualify that you were there for, air quotes, business. Right. Well, and I'm not suggesting that that business happened in Edmonton. I'm not suggesting that that business happened anywhere, anywhere. All I'm saying is I might know what something of that is about. Right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. I forgot what I was going to say. Well, and I think, <laughs> I think even as ex convicts, those prejudices become stereotypes and that stereotype about the police is something that, ca that has kept us safe. And again, today, that is one, not a necessary prejudice. It's not a necessary stereotype and it becomes a negative influence upon us. This is why when I said in the blog, I would have a, I'd have a police officer roll up behind me as I was driving my vehicle and I would start getting just almost to a panic attack state. And, and you know, first thing that ran through my mind is let's fucking pull over. If there was anything of a heat big fucking move, as soon as as soon as a cop comes behind you, just fuck this, over. just pull over. Just pull over. Right? Yeah. But really, the reason why I was ready to pull <laughs> over was because I was going into full-blown panic attack. PTSD. Like, like, that's where I was going. I was going, son of a bitch, son of a bitch. That's all I kept thinking in my head. I need to pull the fuck over right now because I'm going to crash my fucking car because I'm going to go out. 
right? Like, like that's where I was. I was going to pull a fucking Tony Soprano move out, right? And um, yeah, so that that that's changed over time. I don't get as nervous. Yeah, like now I don't I don't look at cops like they're the enemy anymore. I used to look at it. Yeah, like it, they were straight the enemy. Yeah, and uh, our team versus their team. Yeah, but who wants to be king of shit island? Well, and that's and that's the thing. What team? Like, like, why, what do why you, does there even have to be teams? The way I look at it, uh, the the most important thing about business is relationship building. Yeah, and I don't care if you're wearing a, a, a blue monkey suit or a red monkey suit or you're, whatever. Like, if you work for government or or a different business. All that matters is that we work together. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And I think I think that's the other thing. Well, the, the, to to expand on that point is that when you are only on one side, when you're only dealing with criminals, it cuts your business model down in half. In half? Right? Well, I think as soon as you do Even, any business with criminals, it closes, I'd say, at least like... 33% of the doors out there, just opportunities gone just by association. Well, and I think, I think, like I said, the, the other thing is, is, um, those prejudices of criminals is what keeps people safe. Right. I'll put it to you this way. When, when we were doing what we were doing and women were attracted to what we were doing, cause let's face it, they weren't really, well, they might've been physically attracted to us, but they were more attracted to like what we were doing than anything because of the hype, so to say, if that person's attracted (laughs) to the bullshit that you're doing, what the fuck does that say about them? And what does that say that you're, you're attracting to you? Right? Like, yeah, like that's kind of fucky man. Yeah. But when did you start looking at it like that? Even when I was in it, even when I was in it, like I'd have a big, you know, you'd have uh, maybe some drugs on the table or something. And this girl's looking at you like, this, that, or the other thing, or your nickname, your AKA name floats out in a bar or something. And some bitch is like, some woman says, says like, oh yeah, that, you know, he is this or whatever. And the rumor of whatever you are, the hype of whatever you are is, is what they're attracted to. The big wrench. Um, I had a very violent kind of, uh, root, like, I had a very violent history, so to say. So people would people would find out that it was... You didn't know. If I was in a room, <laughs> this is what happened most times. If I was in a room and somebody said, this person is here, whoever owed somebody money would fucking leave. Because, because if I had a van <laughs> outside, the scariest thing in your life was me driving a fucking van. Because if I was driving a van, there was no back seats, <laughs> just like my van is today. <laughs> and maybe it would be called an adduct a bus, <laughs> right? Like, like that's, that's kind of, I would say, the personification of what people thought of me, right? Like you vividly know the feeling of running somebody over. Could. <laughs> I might know that, right? <laughs> But so it's, so if somebody had heard of that history or that supposedness, that, that personification of me and the girl's looking at me going, Hmm, that's somebody I need in my life. That's because they're looking for a hero, right? They're looking for some codependent guy. Really? At the end of the day, they're looking for some codependent guy who's going to get on their white horse and save a hoe. Like, like that's what they're looking for. So, so what are they going to do? They're going to play into that. Right. And then all of a sudden they find out that this guy is not that. So then they wreak havoc. Right. And it becomes this drama thing. I learned really, really quickly in that world that it was better to be a pimp than it was to be some guy looking for that old lady or that mama. And that wasn't even my world. Like that kind of stuff was not my world. My world was like, you got a pussy to sell. We'll fucking sell it. And I'll make sure that that you're not that you're not going to get fucked with. That was that was literally that was literally the, the the perception I had back then, right? Right or wrong? I mean, I thought I was saving all these hookers. That's that's what I thought at the time, right? I mean, that's that's just what it was because I was trying to save all the women in my life growing up, right? So that was my perspective, that was my perception, and that was also my prejudice, right? I thought all Johns were like the worst thing in the fucking world, 
right? And I was going to save all these hookers from these Johns. Did you ever become a John? Nope. Never paid for sex once in my life. Aside from like giving drugs. So I guess in kind favors, <laughs> so to say, <laughs> but like cash itself never happened. No. no. And I beat, I beat a prostitution beef one time by saying that, uh, cause there's a camera in the room. So I said that I was, I just didn't have my permit for, pro- for pornography. Just making porno. Yeah. So when we went to the court or whatever, they were like, you're a pimp, blah, blah, blah. And they tried charging me with that shit. And I was like, no, no, I, I was like a porn director. Just call up James, the little person that we yeah, had. On. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm glad that that stuff is over, but that perception of women has changed to what it is now. Yeah. And like all of those prejudices that I had before are obviously incorrect, right? I'm not I'm not saying or justifying what I what I was doing or what I had did. That's just the fucked up person that I was. Do you still notice they they come to the surface? Not anymore. Here and there, and you go to no. like deflect them. No, not even. Mm-hmm. I think, because I think, and I, I said this in a meeting a little while ago, and probably our recovered or, or listeners that are in recovery will get this. You practice the steps and the principles long enough, you actually become that. And yeah. you don't even see, like I used to say in early recovery all the time, if this had been a year or two ago, I would have, I would have fucking got high, I would have did this, I would have, you know what, after five years, I don't even say that anymore. I don't know how I would deal with certain certain afflictions or epiphanies or adversarial situations today with drugs. Like I only know how to deal with it in a way that's solutionable towards recovery because I've practiced the principles quite like daily in all of my affairs. I'm not going to say I'm perfect at it. I still have to make amends well, on a weekly, daily basis. You're the only person I've ever met that could make the 12 step program sound appealing and real and have actual results. Well, I think one of the, one of the things that we miss, there's a, there's, there's a couple of us big book thumpers out there. I think one of the things that we miss just to go on that premise a little bit is that people think that the steps are supposed to take 12 months. See, I'll tell you why NA was not appealing to me. NA was not appealing to me because they had some fucking bullshit step guide that was going to take me 12 months to get through before I was fucking done. Guess what? I'm an addict and I need motherfucking results now. I can't (laughs) wait 12 fucking months because I'm like relapse road two days from now. Yeah, so two, what two the, days ago. So, so what <laughs> the steps actually did for me in AA when I was looking at these perspective programs was AA said to me, recovery, your road to recovery, it takes as long as you decide and to decide to become recovered. Yeah. I was like, fuck, I want to be recovered because that word to me means past tense. Yeah, it's over. That's what it means to me. Yeah. So when I looked at Bill W., if you really look at that book, what does it say? That motherfucker was recovered in three days. Three days. And he did half the steps loaded. <laughs> right? Because back then it was only six steps. It wasn't no fucking 12. It was six steps. Six six steps. And when he did them, he went into the hospital. He's halfway fucking done. He was loaded in an, asa- in an asylum and he was halfway done. And the only thing that he added into those steps is, I need to go talk to another drunk in order to help him. That was it. That that was the only thing he fucking added, right? So the thing that I have noticed, when you actually look at the way how the steps were done to what it is today, it's convoluted. And the other thing that kind of fucking grinds my gears quite a bit (laughs) is these people who try to rewrite the big book. I know I have a friend or somebody who's fairly close to me out there who just went through this woman's group where this woman rewrote the fucking big book steps for normal people. What in the fuck? Normal people are allowed to come to a big book study and do the same thing. Just because I'm saying I can no longer handle drugs and alcohol doesn't mean you can't come in and say I no longer can handle carbohydrates, whatever the fuck it is. It's literally subject to whatever is fucking your world up, yeah. right? Because I think the other thing is is why some people are unsuccessful in, in this through the steps is because they don't want to believe that their problem is that easily dealt with. They they just don't they just don't want to see that the principles are that easy. 
It's that easy. It's not. It's not complicated. It's not. It's well, not. That's what humans do. We make things fucking difficult. And this is why we say all the time, like one of the cliches in AA is keep it simple, stupid, slow the fuck down. Like, like you'll hear this in meetings. They say, uh, they say easy does it. Easy does it. Guess what? They didn't say easy does it for the fucking steps. They said easy does it for life. I remember when I first came, when I first got recovered and I said, I called my, my, my sponsor up, my first sponsor. And, and I said to him, look, I got a job back in, in, uh, geomatics. And he goes, congratulations for fucking up you idiot <laughs> and i was like what and all this guy says to me is he says now you went and got a career job and you don't even know if you're a fuck up in life yet he's like you don't even know you don't know if you can show up every day to a fucking job you don't you don't you don't know what the fuck you're capable of you decided to f- get halfway done a set of steps and go get a motherfucking career how fucking stupid are you and he was right I mean, I should have been volunteering because I didn't know if I could show up to a fucking career job every day. Yeah. What are you, crazy? I could, I could have a shitty day and say, fuck it, I should probably go to a meeting today. Yeah. You know, I should probably go work a set of steps. I should probably go and be with somebody who's also in active recovery and still early in active recovery. That's who I should probably be around today because easy does it means easy does it into the stream of life. You need to learn how to contribute in a positive way to that stream of life. You and I didn't lift these prejudices just yesterday. This took a long fucking time for us to realize, shit, maybe hookers are not good in my life. Yeah. You know? It wasn't, e- I mean, shit, when, even when he came out of jail, yeah, I had a hard time putting away the prostitution piece. I was like, fuck, I'm saving these girls. You know, that's really what I thought. Yeah, and if that's what you believe, you can justify anything in your head. And, and that's the craziness. Your justifications are lies. Straight up. They're lies and they're delusions. There, there, there's nothing good. If you have to justify something in your life, you're fucked. And that's the other thing too, is I think, <laughs> I think people, they, they sit there and they're like, they're like, uh, when is this over? Like, when do I get to relax? Guess what? Now. Motherfucker. There is no relaxing. <laughs> this shit is happening for the rest of your motherfucking life. So it, you right now better start liking it because if you don't like it, then you should maybe go get some more research and come the fuck back when you realize that that research sucks. Because if this is not an easier way for you to live in a harder fashion in the beginning of it, this is not going to get any easier for you. It's only going to get harder. Why did the principles of the steps actually work in my daily affairs? Because it became easy. Was it easy in the beginning? Fuck no. Yeah. Not even a little bit. Is it easy now? Yeah. Why is it easy now? Because I understand that the harder way is the better way. Kettlebell Keith said this. He goes, I get turned on by saying, hmm, I wonder what that kind of calf exercise is going to do to me. It's going to hurt. <laughs> it's going to hurt. A fucking masochist, sadist fucking guy that he is, right? <laughs> well, guess what? We in recovery do the same thing. Yeah. Right? I'm so, looking at it going, hmm. Oh, that's going to fuck my life right up. I got to go tell him that I lied yesterday. <laughs> Right? And you're thinking all night in your head, you, you almost can't even sleep. And you're like, fuck, I wish I could just call him right now and do it. <laughs> right? Like, like that's what happens. You think normal people, fucking normal people can't do it. They can deal with the lie. Fuck it. I'm just not going to do it again. We can't do that shit. <laughs> We're like, fuck. Shit, I got to call this guy and humble myself. And I got to fucking tell him what I've done. That's fucked up, man. Like, that's... That's fucked up in a way that we look at it and we're like, that's going to be hard. That's another allowable prejudice. In what sense? Well, we, if we lied to somebody, we did something wrong. Us before, we never would have uh, righted that. We would have just been like, too bad. Fuck them. Yeah, I, w- I won't do it again. Knowing, yeah, like, knowing full fucking too, too well, too much you will. ego to <laughs> humble yourself and say I fucked up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, and now it's a, another on the other end of the spectrum for prejudice, and we do everything with integrity. So let me ask you this: um, If we went to a place full blown with these prejudices, so no prejudices, no filter. Okay, I would encourage anybody out there to read a book called Brave New World by Aldous Huxley, because this is going to make sense. Would we be going to a place of no selection? So like the premise in Aldous Huxley's book, Brave New World, is 
you're not allowed to say no to sex. It doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter what they are. And you're not allowed to be monogamous. Monogamy is not allowed. Okay. But then what ends up happening is there's no selection. There is no, there is no selection. You're not allowed to be selective and you're not, you may get a string of like fuckable people that you, you, you're not even physically attracted to, but you cannot say no. Right. So if we were to go to that world, would that world be better than what we have right now? No, everybody would be fucking raping each other. Well, and I, th- I think that there's kind of a pride in selecting. You're proud of your partner. It's the best, it's the best picker well, that you had at that moment, right? Well, you can't say no, but what about the person, like if you're, if you're the hunter and you're out there hunting. They don't have hunters in, in that book. <laughs> but I get what you're saying. Right. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah. There is no room really for an alpha, not alphas like us. Not 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 a, not a chance. But it it just just wouldn't happen because we are selective. Huh. We're probably more selective than that of a beta. It was funny last night I was watching uh, clips on the on the good old YouTube of people passing out on uh on the slingshot and shit like that. I was just <laughs> laughing my ass off, right? <laughs> And somebody said to me, they said to me, they said, why do they pass out? I'm like, because they cannot deal with a fight or flight response. Yeah. What ends up happening is they get a surge of fucking adrenaline in their mind that they have to like fight and they just, (laughs) they just die like the dodo bird. Fuck it. And they just sit the ground and they're like, eat me. You know, <laughs> and they look. They're still little... conscious at that time. They just lose motor force. Well, could you imagine you're flying through the fucking earth, like flying through the earth? You're knocked out, and you come to halfway flying through the earth again. Like what the fuck? <laughs> that would, like that would be scarier than like even just being knocked out. You know what I mean? Like or going through the entire thing. Well, like you bungee know? jumping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You said Dude. slingshotting. I was thinking of the ride at at the festival. Same shit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Same shit. So yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, that to me would be a prejudice. If, if like all of a sudden I, if I was a chick and I saw some guy pass out, I'd be like, well, what the fuck are you going to do if it comes down to a fight, motherfucker? He's just going to like hit the ground and like, uh, beat me up. Like what? I wouldn't want that in my life. Why would I want that in my life? Well, like even, they even teach prejudice in books. Like think of, uh, the mastermind group from, uh, thinking grow rich. That the one chapter in their mass make yourself a mastermind group. You become the the sum total of the five people you hang out with most. That's true. So you're going to be prejudiced on who you pick these five people to be. Yeah, for sure. Right. So, but is it okay? Is it okay to have those prejudices? Fuck yes. I agree. Fuck yes. I mean, we're going to get a bunch of libtards backlash and those far lefties are going to be like, no, it's not. You have to be inclusive of everybody. Well, too, uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to get violent or belligerent. Yeah, I agree. Like, yeah. I'm not I'm not here to incite any pain. I don't want to hurt anybody. Exactly. But, and I, I believe in inclusivity. I believe that people need to be included. If a dude with tits comes up to me and wants to get lucky, I'm not fucking having it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not having it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I just, I'm just not attracted to that. And that's, that's a bio, that's a nature thing. Like I'm not naturally attracted to that, that that's not going to like, that's not going to arouse me in any moment. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and I think the other thing too, and I think the other thing is too, is when we're looking at these allowable prejudices, one needs, I think people are disingenuous or they're lying when they say they don't have them. Okay. They just don't have them. But see, I also don't agree with privilege. I don't like, I can't say what it is to live as an Aboriginal person in Canada. Don't know what that is, but you know what I do know what is, is living in poverty. And I also know what it is to be an employer looking at who I'm going to employ. I mean, I've hired many people in my time, and I can tell you that there are certain ethnic groups that this Canadian government will give you more of a tax credit on than other ethnic groups. I mean, there's a reason why they ask you when you're hired for a job, are you, are you a visible minority? There's a reason why they ask the, your new employee what minority they are. Yeah. There's a tax credit for your employer. 
they're getting paid back at a much greater scale. So, so is it more advantageous for an employer to hire this minority or that minority? And do they equate that into their hiring? Well, I can tell you sometimes they do. Well, look at Tim Hortons. Yep. Yeah, that's, 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 that's the truth. You know what I mean? I mean, and it's unfortunate. You know what I mean? Well, you talk about inclusiveness, like people, like what about uh, equality? Like people need to, these jobs need to be shared. You know, there's high school kids and senior citizens that would love to work there, but they can't. Well, and I think the other dream is, is that we have an economy big enough to accommodate everybody. We just don't. We don't. We take in, and again, this will probably touch on migrant, the migrant issue that Canada just signed into with the UN um, Migration Compact. Um, we do not have a, an economy to float that many refugees slash migrants into Canada. We, we just don't. We can barely support 48 million people. 48 million people is the size of New York State alone. Just New York State alone. We don't, we can't, we can't accommodate more. We, we just don't have it. So, and the trickle down effect, which is basically what capitalism is to a degree, cannot inc- accommodate that size of growth of people. There's retraining that has to happen. There's there's language barriers that have to happen before the migrant, when they come to our country, is even employable. They're unemployable until until they, they have the the basic well until or until they have the basic educational qualifications for our for our markets yeah, if, like msds and workplace safety all of that stuff all of that stuff plus plus like i said language barriers culturalism the understanding of like the bus systems that takes a while that's again we can put label that back into an easy does it thing you can't just slam these people into like you're fucking working tomorrow because then what the, what's then going to happen is Canada is not marketable. You have a market like India that is below average, right? It's below average. And that's why, like in India, I, I did this for a little while where I was bidding on drafting jobs for engineers for Canadian dollars. So it would be a two-day drafting job, and I should probably make in the neighborhood of five thousand dollars canadian doing it when you look at the indian bids coming out of india they were literally bidding the same jobs for me as me for five dollars indian money i can't compete there's no fucking way i can work for two days five dollars indian money Are you fucking nuts like i can't pay the bills on that no so when we look when we're looking at at e-commerce or scales of economy globally we're fucked the only thing that helps us is that our canadian workforce the education is above standard or above the middle you look at americans and i know there's a lot of american listeners but this is the truth their public education system sucks shit and they'll all tell you that most of most of their kids in america um don't even know really where Canada is on a map. They don't have a fucking idea. They on a lot of them honestly believe that Canada is a part of America. They they can't tell the difference. You ask most Americans what the capital is of Canada, they don't have a fucking clue. Some of them, I, you just YouTube this. Some of them don't even know what Washington D.C. stands for. They don't, they don't understand why there's Washington in the West and then Washington, D.C. in the East. They don't get that there's a difference in their own country. So that's, that's what they're trying to promote as a sale, right? How do you sell that? Chinese, when you look at the Chinese country, they don't let their kids off for summer. You know, in grade two, those kids know what our Canadian kids know in grade nine. Yeah, that's how far advanced they are, and they're still cheap labor. We can't compare to their labor. There's, n- there's not, not a fucking hope in hell. Discipline. Yeah, yeah, discipline. Yeah, Di- yeah. discipline. Yeah, that's. I mean, and we, our value on education is not the same. I think it's changing in Canada, but it, it hasn't been like, like how many times were you told, uh, 
Johnny Taxpayer is a fucking moron growing up. Oh, I lived by that. Johnny Taxpayer is a fucking moron and going to school, you're stupid. What? How can you be stupid going to school? That doesn't that still doesn't make sense to me today. But apparently that's that's some of the the prejudices out there. Right? Well, once you get a couple letters behind your name, then work isn't work anymore. So they say. I had letters behind my name when work was still work. I don't even work now. I don't have any letters. Yeah, I don't have work now. <laughs> Actually, but I did start to like survey. So let's uh let's segue over into Christmas when we were youngsters. Uh, what did that look like for you? You know what? For the most part, I had a pretty good, like my stepdad is such a fucking stand up guy. Like he worked his ass off for me and my brother and raised us like his own kids. And, uh, we had it pretty good. You know, like there was a couple times where things were a little fucking slim. Yeah. And, uh, like most of Alberta will be right now. Yeah, you know, it was slim. It, it was a struggle, you know. Um, I don't need to get into any, like, uh, depressing stories without presence. But, like, there was always something. There was always some form of presence. Some years were better than others. But, uh, you know, one that really, like, stuck out to me. And uh, it it wasn't just when I, when I was young. It was a couple of years ago when I was in jail. It So the last Christmas I ever seen my grandma was in active addiction and I was, uh, I think I was 18. Okay. And I drove from Edmonton to Lethbridge to see her and I was all fucked up when I seen her, but we still had some good times together and, Mm -hmm. and some good memories. But then I never seen her again for a couple of years. And two years later, right, right around Christmas, she passed while I was in jail and I didn't get a chance to like go see her when she was on her slippery slope on her way out. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was like the fucking worst Christmas ever for me. That was so rough. Let me ask you this. What was the best present that you still remember today from your childhood? An Ed Bell for hockey helmet. There you go. Goalie mask. (laughs) Fucking sick. (laughs) It's funny. We all have that one. Yeah. Right. I think, I think for me it was a remote control car. So, I have a I have a pretty good one. I told you this. I found it funny. People will tell me it's not funny. It, well, no, it's but not. yeah, I think it's pretty funny. So I'm going to say it anyways. <laughs> um, so my what my mom used to do is she would like wrap presents. Like she would wrap boxes. I still got presents, but she would wrap boxes that didn't have anything in it. Just extra, so it looked yeah, like- so that it looked bigger in pictures and stuff. Because you know that's the French way stereotypes again. And uh, and so anyways. My mom forgot to take out the the boxes that had nothing in them. <laughs> so one of the biggest boxes under the tree was something that had nothing in it. It was a dud. And I, yeah, and I kind of <laughs> thought, like, as I was opening it as a kid, I remember is this, this a, like, is this, like joke? this is really fucking light for something so big. <laughs> so we go and fucking open this thing. Nothing in it. And the shock on my mom's face, like, oh, no, he totally opened the wrong fucking present. And of course, it, it was me who opened the wrong fucking present, right? It wasn't like my mom should have taken it out of the, the tree or anything. No, no. It was me who opened up the wrong fucking present. And then there was a another time. My mom has no patience. She had no patience then. She does now, but she had no patience then. And uh, so she got me, I can't remember, like this woodworking thing kind of deal I, I don't remember the actual name of it but i had like a size some bullshit you know and I, like i didn't have a dad growing up really so my mom's trying to give me some kind of masculine things as i'm growing up <laughs> and so this is fucking great so i go to try to like put this shit together and like mom probably was not so great at reading instructions and me being dyslexic i couldn't read worth a fucking lick anyways until i was like 13 14 years old so i think it was like nine or something and so my mom is looking at this thing and she couldn't put it together she smashed the fucking present 
like in front of me, you know, just smashed it to fucking nothing. And I remember looking up at her like, oh, that thing didn't make it, did it? You know, <laughs> you do, just just watch it, watching the mushroom cloud of the fucking hanger. And you're like, oh, wow. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I mean, my mom could lose it. That again is, you know, back to that stereotype of prejudice of like the French temper. You know what I mean? I don't know. My, my mom used to go buck. <laughs> she, like it, it, it's like a thing. It's a running joke now. Actually, last year was the first year that we had any sort of like family get together, and there was no like flip out situation where everybody's <laughs> telling each other to fuck <laughs> off, and we're all walking out different doors. You know what I mean? <laughs> last year was the first year without that. So I say last year was my best Christmas yet, and then I'm gonna make this one even better. Yeah, yeah. We'll talk about we'll talk about that uh, and uh, one more while on our next recording, but. uh childhood too i saw i saw like my family have a fucking brawl you know over christmas time yeah and that was pretty pretty wild my grandmother so i know i have family who listens to this but i'm I'm gonna fucking feed my grandmother up right now So, (laughs) so so my grandmother used to pit her kids against each other all of the time so my grandmother pits literally my mom against one of my aunts and they fucking, they went at it in a grocery store in a small, small town, small northern town in Ontario. And they fucking, they were like calling each other bitch and shit and all this stuff. And my one aunt, my aunt was fucking pregnant, unbeknownst to anybody at the time, right? And my mom, my mom fucking grabs her by the arm. And like, you know, when you mercy fight somebody, remember the wrestlers, they'd mercy fight somebody and they put them on the, on their knees. You know, yeah, yeah. So yeah. my mom grabs my my aunt by the arm and fucking puts her on her knees. But see, this aunt of mine used to whoop the living shit out of me when I was a kid. Like you have no idea. Like, like I thought my grandmother was something beating me. My fucking this aunt was something worse. Like <laughs> she was fucking. She's just brutal, man. She beat the living piss out of me. And uh, so my mom puts her on her knees. I was probably like. 10 maybe 11 yeah mom fuck her up fucking totally (laughs) cheering my mom on right (laughs) and then that was like when we started making shifts going to my grandmother's house for christmas and it's always been like that ever since then yeah always 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 always. rotation yeah it's never been like everybody can meet at the same time do you remember the first time you ever found the christmas presents you know what were from santa uh, that never happened because my mom was too broke to like hide presents like that. But what, what did happen was I could always guess what was underneath the tree. I, I knew it. I just knew it. Like I always just knew what was under the tree. Well, I remember like finding the shit from Santa and I was fucking hurt, That's... man. I was hurt. I'm like, I've been lied to by my mom and so, my family th- all these years. So as a criminal, let me ask you this. Were you savvy enough at that time to know to keep to keep the fucking thing going? Oh, yeah. I kept my mouth shut. Okay. Absolutely. So how is it that your parents broke to you that Santa wasn't real? I told them on my own. Did you? Yeah. They kept trying to fucking lie to me after I told them, like, no, I know it's not real. Like, I'm so, not an idiot. Okay? You can't keep playing me for an idiot. So <laughs> I realized that Santa wasn't real at some point, right? And I just shut my mouth. I wouldn't tell my mom that I knew because I knew if I told my mom that I knew, I was no, no I was Santa I was losing at least 10, 15 fucking percent of like the stocking <laughs> of the take. You know? Yeah, yeah. That's the way I was looking at that shit. So my mom comes to me and she says to me, she goes, uh, "You ever wonder why Santa's wrapping paper is the same as mine and our writing?" And I knew, saying? I knew what was happening. She's right? Trying to chintz back on the press. <laughs> you know what I said to my mom? I was like, "Well, you both go to Woco." Right, because yeah. that time Woko existed. Yeah. My, she, she's like, and my mom's like, yeah, but Santa's in the North Pole. He doesn't know what Woko is. It, sure, he does because you know what Woko is. So he's got to go. He just gets it on sale like you do. Buys it, buys a whole bunch of it, and has it for years. My mom's like, she, she now she's trying to figure out a new. I can see it on her face. She's trying to figure out a new way how to break this to me because she's not sure if if I'm fucking playing her right now or. If I'm being genuine, she doesn't know. And so finally my mom looked at me and she goes, look at, I can't afford all the Christmas presents this year. So Santa's not fucking real. And that's the way, that's the way it was told to me flat out. Anyway. The other day I kind of like let it out of the bag to my kids that Santa Claus isn't real. 
just because like I felt so hurt that I was <laughs> lied you, to. And you found it on your own. Yeah. And yeah. you know, I think like if I listen, kids, daddy doesn't lie to you. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Santa's yeah, yeah, not yeah, fucking yeah, yeah. real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I get you. I get you. I hear you. Yeah. That's that's what uh that that's when we become hypocrites almost. But then it's like, are we hypocrites because of because we know all this shit or like, well, I'm, I don't know. Where the fuck did Santa even come from anyways? And, and why the well, fuck is it so materialistic at Christmas time? And there's why also, we... there's also the Burt Kreischer thing. So I don't know if anybody has listened to or watched Netflix, Burt Kreischer, but you need to watch this on, on Netflix. Cause he's, it's fucking hilarious. He believes that there's a correlation between kids not believing Santa Claus and girls start sucking dicks. Like, like it all what? happens within the same year. He's like, so my daughter's like 13 years old and still believes in fucking Santa Claus because I'm pretty sure that the second that she doesn't believe in Santa Claus, she's going to start sucking dicks. So, so he's like, we're writing that out until she's fucking 17 years old. And then he started talking about, I shouldn't paraphrase his, his thing because he should really watch it on Netflix. But it's fucking hilarious. Like it's hilarious because he just makes up some bullshit about, I about we were, fucking I thought, Santa. I thought we were supposed to cut down on the swearing. Yeah, I guess I'm being bad. Fuck that. Sorry. Yeah. Not sorry. Yeah, well. <laughs> there's, are we about, there's, always are we time, about, there's always time to improve are we about wrapped yeah up we're about we're done we're, we're there done? Yeah. okay thank you everybody please su- subscribe and share with all your friends you can find our after the show blog at www.lifeonlifestermspodcast.com justin and i have both been pumping out extra big blogs lately and we're also bringing on lifers lifers are blog- the new bloggers the new bloggers yeah part of the community part yeah of the life on life's terms team yeah and yeah. together everyone achieves more yeah i just want to thank you everybody for si- uh tuning in and listening to this and i want you guys to have a merry wonderful christmas and don't go broke we're going to be taking time off on the what is it the 28th uh which two episodes? 27th and 28th yeah yeah but we'll be back on the third and the fourth of 2019 absolutely yeah so uh and then we there's a couple more episodes coming out after this Yeah. And that's it for this season. I love you all. Have a wonderful time. You are the pride.